to 55 that come to you. Now we would, when, I suppose when I was going in, it was very common for us to go directly from school. We, we, we wouldn't take anyone from leaving cert now. I have a number of two 18 year olds at the moment. And uh, I would say to them, go to college, experience life, you know, get involved, relationships, see the world, and don't tie yourself down at the moment. Because, um, you know, it's important as you go through a journey like, you know, priesthood, you know, you can be so immature at 24, 25, you know, you don't know what, what uh, is going on when you're challenged. And I suppose many of us, when we did go into priesthood, we were landed out into the world and you, you had your seven years of study behind you, but at the same time, you know, you were still very young, you were 25 years of age, and you were out there, and my first appointment was in teaching in our club, and you know, you were into a school environment straight away, and just come into terms with priesthood. So the bishops very much look now for people who have life experience, where they can bring those gifts in, so this year now, for example, the guys that have applied, five have applied currently, and the youngest is 26, and the eldest is 43. So and they bring a whole range of experiences, electricians, accountants, um, people who have worked in uh, farming backgrounds, uh, people who have been working abroad in missions, you know, volunteering, and uh, so that you get a whole variety of backgrounds and again they bring all those skills and like life experience with them so that's the thing about priesthood today is you get guys of all ages and experience and what do you think is the uniting factor in like different people from different backgrounds being drawn to the priesthood i suppose mainly they all come from a faith community you find that they have their parents or somebody in their family was very much uh, involved in the faith and they have a strong faith and for many of them it was something that's been niggling with them right through like the, you often find in the thirties and forty years, this is something that was with me since I was a teenager, but I never did anything about it. I've gone out and I've been involved in relationships, but there's something just missing, and they keep going back to this. I have this call to priesthood, and I'd like to explore it further. So, uh, but they all have some sort of link, be it with Vince de Paul or the Simon community or their parish as an altar server, and they, they go back, I suppose, in the present um, context. There are very few altar servers now, so you, you get a different type of person kind of coming to you, especially the younger people. Many of them don't have experience, like many of us were altar boys and altar servers, and we came through our experience of parish. Today, the younger people generally don't. It's um, more through Vince de Paul, Legion Mary, uh, U2000, and uh, Simon Community. And they've got involved there, and they feel they're helping and supporting of people, uh, plus they'd like to bring some kind of religious aspect to that journey and then the kind of debate whether priesthood is for them or religious life. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how crucial is the kind of environment they grew up in, being a religious environment for them to go on to be a priest? It, it helps if you get support, but I've, I've had two or three guys who come to me and said, oh God, my parents don't want this at all, they want me to be a barrister, they want me to be, you know, go on and do my law and continue what I'm doing. And um, so some of them don't get huge support from home because some of them feel, well, this will be a lonely journey for you. Uh, some say you're the only son in some cases, mm -hmm. and we want the, the family tradition and the name to be carried on. So you get all, all this, but you often find they're so strong within themselves. And then, especially when they're in their late 20s and 30s, they're very much stronger that this is something I want to do and, and try. And how do you guide them through that hard time? Trying this? It is one of the hardest things in the world to trying to do something that your parents don't really support you on. How do you support the young men? I try to support them by saying, right, you really have to go with your heart and your gut. And if that's what, that, otherwise you're going to have regrets. So, I, and I would say, anyone that's going into seminary, this is a journey. Just the fact you're going into your first year doesn't mean you're going to be a priest. You're on a journey, and through that journey of five, six, seven years, whatever it takes, uh, you will find out, and you know in your own comfort zone, is this for me? So always go in with that. Because many of them come to me and say, I have a mortgage, I have a house. I say, never sell your house. If you have a mortgage, try and get people to, you know, uh, pay that mortgage, get people into your house so that, you know, you make sure that you're on a journey, there's no pressure. Once you go into something, you see it as, hopefully I will be, but maybe along the road, it will be very clear to me. So it's a time of discernment. So I would say, you know, go with your gut. And uh, hopefully in time your family will come around. Because if they see that you're happy and you're contentment, 
uh, is going to be key and that will influence them. And when people do join, is, do many people s- succeed in finishing the seven years? Yeah, I suppose at the moment you would say that maybe about two thirds of people now would. Uh, when I was joining, it was a huge fallout because many people went in at 17, 18, 19. You know, now the guys are much more mature. And if the guys go in this year, the youngest will be 26. So like they've got a huge bit of experience uh, at that stage. You know, so it's the, the chances of uh, the continuing is um, most likely high, the higher anyway. And that's one change you've mentioned is fact that the church no longer recruits uh, younger men they don't have the life experience yeah. uh, what other changes has occurred over the time since you've been here I suppose um, you know one of the things was in my time and before that the opportunities to work in the church were very few you know I remember when I left DCU the Archbishop asked me to set up the parish pastoral worker program at Matter Day the Institute of Matter Day and that gave an opportunity for men and women to go and work as lay people in parishes so they got a qualification to work in parishes, having a, d- a degree in theology. So some of these people probably in the past would have thought about priesthood. And now to say, here's another avenue to serve the church without being ordained. So you've got parish pastor workers, we've deacons who go out, men, married men now who work uh, in parishes and um, they continue with their family. They can do the, have the sacraments, they can uh, perform the sacrament of baptism, marriage, they can assist at funerals. So then they can bring a lot of skills too. So the church is changing and different methods. So I suppose in the past we were very much focused that people thought the only way you could serve the church was in the religious life. Now as lay volunteers and as lay people they can serve in many ways. So there's a whole variety of options. You find in the Matter Day Institute now many people, many women go teaching religion in schools and being chaplains. So they bring those skills and they can still have to you know, uh, be married uh, in their own way. So they can involve the church. So so that focus and options for people now today is, is greater. Correct. And uh, what kind of, when, when you are looking for young men to join the priesthood, do you have any like recruitment techniques or do you just put up posters or? Yeah, posters, the email, um, and going around the colleges and, uh, and just to meet them uh, per, in person and then try and give them an experience of what parish life is like. Uh, if they're not involved in their parish, you know, try and get involved in the parish. I link them all with their local priests so that the journey for a while, for a year or so with them, uh, they kind of get a sense, is this for me? Mm. So and I would keep in touch with them and any sto- any yeah, questions I would have, I would try and help them. I would go down to the news and have a weekend with them there and say, this is a shared experience now. You've been in your lovely little apartment there, already had for the last few years now. This is what environment the news is going to be like. So let's live there for the weekend and see. And, do what the other students are doing there so we get that experience of your food and uh, living on a budget and all that sort of thing so they get that experience and then say yeah this is for me or this is not for me i couldn't hack this you know? it sounds like college life anyway it's college, yeah. exactly it's very much college life yeah. you know sometimes guys have been working out as solicitors or barristers or you know they, they kind of have a nice lifestyle and then you're saying you know the reality is when you go in here and the reality is when you're going to be appointed in the archives in dublin you can be in different types of parishes. Yeah. You, know, you can be in the inner city here, you can be in the Valley Nuns, you can be in the Valbrigans, you can be in a uh, very high class parish, so the whole variety. So that you need to be able to be adaptable and uh, and you need to have a good work ethic, you know, because you're around the clock, you can be called, like I can fall in, or the night here in Hall Street Hospital, you know, you get calls to babies who are struggling and just born. And so you, you need to be able to be adaptable and to be somebody who can give your time. And how do the majority react? Do the majority find it okay to, when they are first introduced? Yes, most of them do. They find it daunting, challenging. Um, I suppose when you go for the interview, there's a challenging interview. You're interviewed by three people. And you have a psychological evaluation. So you're trying to expose yourself, you know, and you have to be confronted with the goods and the not so goods about yourself and your personality. Then you go through the medical. So there's a, a process there and that can be quite daunting. And uh, I suppose like any job, you know, you have to go for an interview and be successful and then you have to apply to college like yourselves who are in college, you know, you go through all the things of exams and, and uh, some guys who've been out of education for a long, long time, you know, coming back and saying, God, how will I face my exams and my essays and my thesis? And, you know, so they, they really experience what everybody else in, in third level life experiences today. And can you just elaborate on the interview a little bit, the process? Processes, um, I would... When I journey with a guy, I would sit, make a decision and say, right, so I recommend to the Archbishop I 
put forward five guys here. I think they're ready now for interview, but I'm only one person who's a set of eyes on them now. I'd like you at a panel. There'll be always uh, a woman will be there. There'll be one of our priests at least, and maybe somebody from another parish. So there'll be three people there, and they challenge them with the questions. What for the scenario to them, a situation? How would you deal with that? They get a sense of them. Um, are they rigid? Are their views going to be very, very tight? Are they really, you know, they might ask them about, you know, uh, homosexuality, how would you deal with that in, in priesthood? Um, uh, how would you deal with uh, someone who's really struggling and very poor? So they try to get a, a sense of who the person is. And if they're very strong and there's no budging in them, that's the kind of a sign that this person isn't adaptable. In priesthood and religious life today, you can be so adaptable, you can be in no way judgmental. So they'll be looking for somebody who's non-judgmental, who's very open, and who's willing to share their skills. And we don't all have all the skills, but they'll be looking for kindness, love, care, support, and somebody who's you know, a, a grafter and a worker. And would you meet many young people who, who are very rigid, or are the majority quite adaptable? Yeah, there, there, there's some people that are very, very rigid, uh, rigid. There are quite a few people you would meet, and uh, they're lovely people, but they are so rigid and tunnel vision, and this is the only type of uh, worship that you can have. And you couldn't, you, you can't work in an environment like that. You can't have people that are just going to be solely, this is the only way. So if you're not adaptable, then, you know, to me, you know, they're not the sort of priest that we need in the, the, the Dublin Diocese. And the majority would be quite. Yeah, the majority. Yeah. But there are always the, those few who are just, this is the way it is, and I will work under these conditions. And that's it. And where do you think that <coughs> kind of rigidness comes from? It's sometimes in their, the way they've been brought up. And there are certain organisations that have a certain way of doing things. And this is the only way. And uh, they're not the sort of people that you want. Because unless you're adaptable in ministry, uh, you won't survive. And then you're going to alienate so many people. And you do want total damage. So you want people who are very, very open. And people who will take everybody as they are in with a rigid attitude and this is the way it is and you, the damage you would do in confession you know somebody came into you and told their story and you start judging on them and that and told damage so you're alienating people and that's a lot and we see that with Pope Francis Pope Francis has come here breath of fresh air and saying get out to the margins get out to the outskirts none of this kind of living in your palaces uh, get out there and graft with people and be with the poor I was just going to come on to Pope Francis there yeah. um, do you think he is a good kind of in a way, an advertisement as a church for he, young people. He is great. I, I, since he's come into office, you get more bites from the email and the internet and stuff. People are now beginning to inquire. I suppose we have to look at our church in Ireland for the last number of years. We've been burdened, uh, and rightly so, by the whole child abuse issue. And so on toll damage. And so many people didn't want to be associated with church, and many young people too. Oh, I don't want to be associated with an organisation that has done this. So our past has really haunted us, and many of our priests have let us down badly in the past. But now, all of a sudden, they see this vision of Pope Francis, who's very much, get out there, his message is something that they identify with. And I suppose, I remember I was 16 years at University Chapman before I came here in DCU, and one of the things that I noticed with the young people was, they have a great social conscience. That I'd never had a problem getting people to help in the Vincent St. Paul and Ballymun Flats, you know, the towers there, and g giving grinds in the schools, and just flocked to you, the Simon community. We, we were inundated with volunteers. So there's a great heart there. And I think that's where uh, Pope Francis is really touching people today, is that's the type of Pope, that's the type of faith, that's the type of religion that I want to be involved with. And I think he's opened so many doors. So you can see the confidence is coming back in people now. And when you meet them saying, you know, you are 30, 40 years of age, and, and why didn't you apply? Well, it was there when I was young, and then it went, and then the church scandals, I didn't want to be touched. But now I see this Pope, he's given me a kind of a whole refreshment and a challenge to go out there and do something. So I, I see there's an increase in certainly the volume of my work since he's come in. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, so the, the, there was a decline as long as... There was as very much a decline. Um, and, and, and a natural decline in the sense that people didn't want to be associated with a church that had this history, you know. And I suppose we were in, inundated by the, through the media, and, and rightly so, these people have been exposed and people were shocked by what happened that the church had let them down so badly by some of its priests and religious. And 
But now there's a kind of a new confidence, a new breath of fresh air to feel that the Vatican and the Church is doing something about these issues. And uh, now there's a kind of a new sense of, yeah, this is some, an organization I'm happy now to belong to. And do you think the Church is ready to uh, kind of take advantage of this? Kind of I, I think the Church is ready because we, we see, like we see in Dublin Dice at the moment, like we have very few guys uh, under 40. You know, we, we have 199 parishes in the Dublin Diocese. We have guys in hospitals, prisons, uh, a whole variety of ministries. And we know that we have something like uh, 200 and maybe 50 priests. But in the next seven years, 100 of those 250 will be over 75. And we retire at 75. So you can just imagine that like, there's going to be a huge void there. So you're talking about 150 priests for 199 parishes. So you've so got a big job ahead of you. It's a big job. You know? yeah. And uh, again, we're very grateful for the parish pastor workers that have come in and the deacons and the lay volunteers in the parish. They keep parish life going. And that would be the way I don't see at the moment we'll ever get to a stage where we had all the priests from the past. And we know from the huge missionary tradition that we had, you know, we sent so many, many priests and religious out to Africa and different places. And now they're coming back to you know, help us. We've got an African guy, a Nigerian guy here now with us here in this parish and he helps us. He's doing some study here. So it's interesting how things have turned around. Many of these international people that have been supported by the missions in the past are now going back to help Ireland and Ireland is kind of a mission country now. We actually we actually interviewed two African priests for yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're great 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 guys That's, yeah. absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, so going forward, do you think there will be enough priests or do you think the lay people will be integrated into the oh, mass yeah. more. Yeah, in our, in our parish systems at the moment, we're looking at models of parish now where we're going to group parishes together. And we all hope to have at least um, a parish pastor worker, a catechist, and then working with whatever priests are there. And obviously there are, there are sisters and brothers and helping out, and the lay volunteers. So it's going to be very much, as it's happening now in Dublin, our parish pastor workers are key in so many of our parishes. And you said there's a woman on the interview process. Yes. How, where, where's the role of women in the church going forward? Well, you see many of our parish pastor workers are women. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're in there involved in the parishes. They're a parish pastor council. They're a huge influence to bring that skill of tenderness and care and compassion that we may not always have. I'll say that we, we're not tender, but at the same time, they bring a different dimension to it. And uh, they've been a huge... And again, on an interview board, it's very much... A, 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 and important that we have the gender balance and get that sense of is as a woman is this a person that I could you know work with and so they bring a perspective to every interview you know so it's important that we get uh, different perspectives and uh, that's included in the process. Perfect. Mm. That's great. Maybe just um, finally, um, what do you think the fundamental attracting factors to the priesthood have changed since you applied? In any way, or like I know we've touched on all the issues about like the, the, dif the different circumstances, but in terms of what actually drives people to become priests, do you think that's more of a kind of consistent, kind of almost eternal thing that the things that drive people to serve, to serve God? The Lord. Lord. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think for like one time you would have said to, it was like the, historically in Ireland there was a priest in every family that was you know there was one stayed in the farm and one went to the priests and one you know went uh, abroad or whatever. And uh, that has certainly died, you know, that whole traditional thing of having the priest in the family, that's gone. Yeah. And so there would have been a lot of guys who had fallen away from the church because it was their mother's vocation or somebody else's vocation. It wasn't theirs, it was an expectation for them. Now you find that people that are coming now, it's very much in their own heart. It's coming from them. It's coming from the relationship with Jesus Christ and saying, yes, I want to serve Jesus Christ in this way. So it's the, the influences from within themselves and uh, very little ex uh, external stuff from family in the, of, of the guys that you have today. It's so, almost pure. Yes, absolutely. Kind of yeah. Expectation. Yeah, exactly. That whole thing of, has gone now from Ireland, you know, the, thing, the expectation that you have to have somebody in the priesthood. And we had that for years and years, and we saw the fallout of that too for many guys who just, uh, it wasn't there. And after 10, 12 years, they decided, well, that's not for me. And um, you know, now today you find that once guys do go in, there's a better chance of them you know, staying because it's very much from their own heart and um, so I'd say that's a big difference in, in recent years. That's a big, that's a good thing though. Yeah, it was a great thing, very possible, very yeah. possible, yeah. It's much more genuine and, yeah. and 
I suppose the process of going to psychological evaluation, all the, the um, things one has to go through to you know be screened to, to make sure that we are presenting people who are competent and people who will serve. And uh, because I suppose many times we people saw us as a security going to a seminary and you're going to be educated and then you're going to have this nice house and you're going to be here and there and you know, there's an image of priesthood and that's not the way it is anymore. You know, you've got to pay our bills. You've got to. <laughs> do like everybody else and know what life is about, you know, no, nothing's going to be handed up to you. And how do the young men find seminary? Do they find it tough? Yeah, they do find it, you know, they find it's, it's changed a lot. There's much more freedom now. Like one time these guys would have been locked up and clo- enclosed. Now they're out and about, they're doing pastoral work through their six, seven years of study. They're having like different experiences. They're working in prisons, they're working in hospitals, they're working in parishes. They're working with communities like Vincent Paul and Simon, so to sort of get exposure uh, to different aspects of life over their journey. Uh, obviously, they have the challenge, like all students, of getting facing exams and the tensions of that, and then living on a budget, you know, getting to know that this is what I have and I can manage this, or I can go here, or I can go there with the X amount of money. So, um, so there are challenges in it, but it's good. Do you it's think it's much more human? Much more human. Yeah. Much more human. I think the formators and the people that they're working with are, are much more in touch with the real world now than they have been in, in other times. Do you see many on Facebook or on their phones? Oh yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. All oh, Facebook, everything, you know, it's a, it's a big thing now and they're into technology. You go to meetings now and they're on their laptops there and their, their iPhones and oh, they're very much in, t- in touch with them. They know much more than me and they're always on to be on the website and stuff like that. They're way behind and on the right. Uh, do you think uh, the church needs to work on that public perception? Oh yeah, absolutely. We have huge work to do there. And I think our communications office is very much there on Facebook and stuff. They're there to a lot of stuff. They're, they're very much into it. But I suppose most guys have been out there for a while. We need to be more in touch with that. And it's a learning skill for, I see my niece and nephews, and it's like <laughs> water them. They just uh, dabble into it. And I struggle a bit, but <laughs> we get there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, very, very fine. Huh? We've taken plenty of time now. Um, you mentioned some, like, uh, some very positive stuff about um, Pope Francis uh, possibly boosting vocations and maybe increased kind of lay involvement. But, um, well, not but, we've talked to uh, another priest who is slightly more negative about the possibility of, oh, of the priesthood, yeah, of a gentleman called Father Brendan Hogan. Do you think there is genuine cause for optimism for, um, in terms of the voca- you know, in terms of people coming into vocations through Pope Francis and through increased kind of involvement with the laity? Do you think that's where the kind of maintenance of the Mass and maintenance of the Church lies? Yeah, I think we're always going to need priests to celebrate the Eucharist. So, but I think priests now need to be team players. The day of the parish priest and the day of the curate and the living in the ivory tower, it's all about teamwork in parish. Like anything I would do here, I would go to the parish pastoral council. We meet here once a month. We put all our decisions together and we say what's well, best for the parish. So you have the collective decision of a group of people uh, from different backgrounds within your parish. And uh, they're just, that's what I was saying earlier, we, we don't need guys who are fixed in tunnel vision, we need guys who are open to work with people and uh, bring that message equally to them. So parish team is the way forward in ministry, so it will be a different type of church, but a, a better type of church, because lay people have huge skills to bring. And I suppose all, all of us to our baptism, whatever, whatever we are, uh, that's our calling, is to help the church, but certainly from a sacramental point of view of anointing the sick and hearing confessions, Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, We've got to go to (laughs) (laughs) The real work is in our class. That's only their own, so it's not too Oh, you're not too far. What are your exams again? We don't have them. We don't have them. It's all assignments. It's all stuff. Yeah. Essay. Yeah.